Exactly. So why don't we just become more aware of the tactics that trolls use? And why don't, why don't we know some of the same things that lawyers and cops do about how people form their words and thoughts and how people disseminate propaganda campaigns? Because at the end of the day, it's just a cheap marketing campaign, a tar cheap targeted marketing campaign, picking up the weak, you know, the unstable, or people who are, are very vulnerable and persuadable, depending on how often they're carpet bombed with the same things, right? And so if, if we're made aware of these things, then would we choose uh, wiser? I'm kind of hoping so. I'm hoping that if we have original content uh, that shows, you know, this isn't what exists, this is what it could be, right? But this is what we actually do know, right? And then a similar tactic was used in 1920, 1950, and it worked again in 1980, all the way in the 40s and 50s. It was started by tobacco denying science, which then like the pro-lifers and the climate deniers then took over, reverse engineered, and now we have uh, different silos of people pitting against each other. And what is the greatest tool that that fascists and propagandists have, divide and conquer, make us all believe our own reality and fight, fight each other when we're probably just arguing about the same side of the elephant, right? So confirmation bias, we can't really do anything about with awareness or even transparency. You believe what you want to believe and the more I reason with you, the more angrier you get because you don't think that I'm validating your absurdities, right? <laughs> Which I'm not. <laughs> and that's my bias. So my audience are the people that I'm hoping come onto the platform are the are the centrists, the independents, the slim margin of five to seven percent, or maybe even three to five percent of people who are old, who are moved, who are willing to be moved by reason, right? And when I say I'm moving to, willing to be moved by reason is we're having a rational discussion, and a rational discussion means that I listen to you and you listen to me, and I'm willing to have my position moved by reason or we can agree to not, uh, we can agree to, to disagree. <laughs> we can agree to disagree and still hold each other and realize we hold this energy and that maybe your just experience is different, but what is the problem at hand that we're trying to solve? It's not about ego, it's not about whether you're right or wrong, it's like, what is the most pressing problem? And then after that, we can, we can continue to beat the shit out of each other. Because it's a big problem, right? Propaganda and disinformation, and trying to model fidelity um, on the on the web has every implications from from everything to finance and backing, but especially in the in the culture wars, right? If you look at every hack, uh, whether it's a technical system or of a city, it's social engineering that does it, right? And it has uh, huge costs, you know, because I live in New York, uh, and and the U.S. is. Uh, going through some a, a few hurdles and challenges, <laughs> a few challenges. I, I imagine everybody else in the world well, looking. We don't need uh, to be politically correct. I'm not the kind of the You know, I can imagine everybody else in the world looking at America, going, "What are you doing? Like, what are you doing?" Except the UK because they're going through the bigger shit. Actually. I know. It's true, actually. It's true. Yeah, you're naming so, as well. You, you, you so, <laughs> and so, you know. Uh, so I've been working on this for three years, and there's other companies that are doing it, but what they're doing is they're just doing fact-checking, right? They're looking up specific, um, you know, line-by-line, word-by-word analysis and parsing that data and looking at how closely it matches and how it's disseminated, right? And correlating different sort of um, sets of data to try to figure out what is true and what is not, what's been validated and what's not. And, um, you know, recent research, because uh, and I think it was, Thomas Davis. Uh, he's a researcher at um, Oxford University. He's a behavioral scientist and a data scientist. And said uh, he's tabling a paper right now that's uh, going through a rewrite and resubmit process that said, you know, if the content doesn't even matter, all I think is that it's just a signal. It's a signal to have other people that, you know, feel the way that you do to come cluster. Right? And so this was, at first I was a little bit depressed because I spent the last two years <laughs> <laughs> trying to do a line by line, word by word analysis to look at, you know, look at the content as to see how that content was created, right? So seven or eight different proprietary bot crawlers, including what we call an onion bot that's, that can go into the dark web, do a data scrape of every incidence or, or event, right, of a, of a story, and then look at how that story morphs or changes, right? Uh, scraping it of the metadata and creating hashtags around it, like hash, a hash table around it, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and then looking at the velocity of spread and how it spread. And then also studying uh, after, you know, beyond the metadata, looking at the source behavior, right? Do they, is, do they have a credible, legitimate 
uh, background and activity um, and, and a history of being able to write, whether you're an organization or person, of this activity that you're that you're pushing forward, right? Of the story, uh, and what are all the relationships between the actors in the space, and how much of what's being put out can be organized by by everything from targeting, framing, to severity, um, to the frequency of the terminology as to what they mean uh, by specific words. If you say the word environment uh, in one place, they probably mean it in a completely different way in, in another country, in another community, uh, in another you know, political entities, right? Yes. I mean, Another thing is when, when I was looking at your side, you you truthfully mentioned that you know we live in the era full of the bullshit. <laughs> so I would really like to ask you like what went wrong? Why we <laughs> why we are why are we why are we at that stage? Because it's true, like the internet and the, the this era is full of the bullshit. So what went wrong? Like I think you're the expert. <laughs> well, you know, I can I can only speak from the perspective, from the North American perspective, because you know, I'm Canadian. Um, Part of the reason why this was really uh, important to me is I saw this building. Is um, So I was born in a military dictatorship in South Korea. It's the world's most heavily armed border. And then my father moved us to Iran Isfahan in 1975, right before the Islamic Revolution, where we lived there for two years until um, it became so violent that we had to leave. And then we got stuck in London. So um, in that process, it was a very kind of a complicated childhood. Uh, but people who are war traumatized are very poor communicators, <laughs> like, you know, my parents sometimes. <laughs> and so I became a journalist in an effort to understand, uh, you know, how the global becomes personal and, and what moves people, right? And so it made me, uh, it gave me a healthy sense of skepticism. And I became very politically active when I was 14, selling newspapers, advocating for higher minimum wage. Uh, and I said, you know, I'm going to be a journalist. And at 16, I was given an opportunity to be an on-air translator uh, during the Olympics. So in a way, I've lived with uh, bullshit and war stories and suppositions uh, my entire life that could never quite be articulated, right? But there were all these, these different forces. Uh, and then afterwards, when I look at systems, systems have failed us and technology has kept us from actually communicating. And so it was when I started building the training corpus for my AI, and I'll, I'll unravel what I just said about institutions have failed us, right? Education hasn't armed us for critical thought or even for intellectual humility, right? How can you, if you, if you don't allow for what you may not know and what you cannot possibly know, if you can't hold two opposing views in that one side and, and allow space for that, then how are, how are we supposed to learn and grow at all, right? And then all it does is like cyclone around each other, right? Like into these like little hardened silos. Uh, media has failed us because in the 90s, in the 80s and 90s, uh, media outlets that were in North America are supposed to become, supposed to be uh, pillars of democracy because how can you have a vote if you're not educated? failed us as, as they became more like publicly traded soup companies, right, and commodities, right? So systematically, exactly. And then when you had an ad revenue model in the most predominant form of education, entertainment, and communication, like the social media, where 60 to 70 percent of people uh, get their news, where you know, it doesn't even have to make sense, it doesn't have to be true, and it doesn't have to have substance, but people make money just by making you look, right? And that pings off of more extreme content. Right? And meanwhile, so, you know, we think that we're rational beings, but we're emotional beings. Right? So if I'm really unhappy and everything sucks, right? And I'm sending out that signal and I'm only clicking on things that, you know, that validate that everything is horrible and everything sucks, then I'm going to pretty much be fed a steady diet with the SEO and the news feed. <coughs> Pardon me. Everything that sucks. And pretty soon, I won't feel so lonely. I'll have other group of people that I can like hang out with and talk about how sucky everything is. And it's that son of a bitch's fault, right? Yeah. It's never my own. <laughs> so that's how. And that, that, that what went wrong. Right? <laughs> and, and that's kind of like that's kind of what went wrong, right? So how do we reverse engineer that? Uh, very carefully. <laughs> So, you know, the other companies that I, that I said that are using fact-checking and crowdsourcing, part of uh, the, that fact-checking, it doesn't go far enough, right? Uh, because we have to look at, like I said, all the things that we talked about before at the source behavior, but then what do we do with all that information? I mean, for the first year, we, we create original content around it. 
you know, kind of like Mythbusters meets Snopes, right? Uh, by having people guest slots or, or people just discussing honestly um, about, you know, I live in this area, I was there when this happened, I think the story is, say, 60% bullshit and these are the reasons why. Um, if you have, if I've missed a, a you know, a step in my in my linear logic. <laughs> if I've missed a citation and you have something better, post it below and we reward you with tokens with the machine learning algorithms constantly learning in the background, right? So you're just helping me tag and label the data and then later on we're using it for um, to automate uh, creation of indexes and, and dictionaries, all right? Uh, constantly learning what people model it as, as being, as, as having, uh, as being a insightful, useful, or validated um, truth for them in a way. Talking actually about the education system, like how do you actually see the, the, the this emerging text, like the, the blockchain AI, the actually transforming the education system? Because actually, we know, we talk about a lot on the other side about that the actual education system is completely failing. The, is not preparing the, the millennials for the, for the job positions at the current market at all. So how do you actually see these techs transforming the, the, the education system? <laughs> So education, major institutions have failed us and they teach children how to be obedient workers by rote memory as opposed to really having memorize. critical thought. Memorize instead of actually engaging each other or being emotionally honest, right? Or being more creative. So um, that feeds a lot of industries, right? That, And that's what I'm hoping AI will disintermediate are all the jobs that human beings were never meant to do. These are ones that require vast amounts of information and repetition, repetition, right? And consistency. We were never meant to do that. We were meant to use our imaginations and create, right? And become stewards um, of each other. And living. They're currently <laughs> punished for that emo emotion and the, the, the honesty, you know? I mean, that is punished in the in current education system. If you express your opinion, <laughs> it's happening everywhere. <laughs> yeah. No, it happens. It it does happen everywhere. So you know, if if situations um, fail us, and we have sp specific technological tools, and if you talk to a hacker, some of my most talented friends who are hackers, right, dropped out of school when they were 11 and just taught themselves taught themselves how to code and started opening up companies. Right, um, and with the World Wide Web, we are able to teach ourselves and find fellowship in some way uh, to that regard. And if you talk to a lot of millennials who went into debt to go to university and came back to for their like you know fourteen dollar an hour job, being twenty thousand dollars in debt, they're never going to do that again. They're not going back to the schools, right? We have you know self learning platforms. We have YouTube channels. We have meetups. We have ways that we can congregate and cluster around each other based on the philosophy of how we're going to use this technology. Now, when I say that, you know. It wasn't me that said this, but a friend of mine who said a, technolo a technology without philosophy is efficiency without purpose, right? And if we find other like-minded people who see a useful way to use you know, AI, blockchain, IFT, all of that stuff, because these are, you might as well just call them can openers or email, right? Because they're just things that we slot in to do specific things, uh, whether it, or not it's to make things transparent, automate uh, smart contracts so that we don't need a third person, um, identity, and, and AI is simply automation. It's automation and, and taking in the big aggregate view, right? Uh, the thing about AI right now, our machine learning algorithms, is that we can, through original content, through responsible management of data hygiene, data integrity, and data sovereignty, right, giving, giving that back to people, uh, we can actually create programs where it's the machine learning that's training people to be more human. I, I, would, I, I used to joke that, you know, I'm training my AI, I'm training my, I'm building a training corpus. And then I realized, like, wait a minute, when I look at how I, like, you know, which, which classifiers that I'm creating and, and the dictionaries that I'm, like, kind of trying to create, I thought, no, it's the AI that's training me. It's making me so much more aware of my own biases. It's making me aware that, you know, um, that I have those blind spots, too. Right, and that, that there are other people that might see things completely differently that I had never thought of, even in some of my most cherished beliefs, right? Whether it's politics or culture. What, 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 why do you think that people are in general uh, nervous about AI? Do you think just because it's something that is unknown for them? Because they're still in the, you know, in the, in, in publicly, you know, people are still nervous, you know, partially because they don't understand that, partially because it's something so um, I think most people tend to be um, intellectually lazy and they consume a lot of pop culture. And then there are a lot of people who don't understand technology that are writing books about AI and the way that it'll transform societies. Thank you, social sciences. Uh, and and it's, you know, you people are worried about the wrong things. 
why there's nothing that you know because I'm not uh, I'm not naturally technically minded it was something that I had to really break down and learn with the help and guidance with my very technical friends who brought me into the space um, you know thankfully invalidated some of my assumptions and and uh, you know uh, steered me or even argued with me some of my favorite people I argued with for the first six months to 12 months as to what this technology could do or could not do or supposed to do and now we have this grudging respect for each other and it's fantastic right uh, so you know what is it supposed to do what are the problems that we're trying to solve right and can we do this and yes we can and some of us say yes or no the thing is when we look at industries as to why people are afraid they're like worried about Terminator and that general AI and I think that's nothing simply but uh, a, a form of misanthropy they think that human beings are just so disgusting and so stupid that it won't take any time at all before AI just becomes so much more starter. But you know, our products and our world is reflective of who we are as, as, as human beings, as collective humanity. This is who we are and it's mirrored back to us. And it's not binary. It's not this or this. It's this and this and this and this. So I like to think, especially when it comes to disinformation, why, um, why I could not tackle truth is that truth is dependent on interpretation, right? Whereas willful misleading and disinformation has a pattern, right? Has a pattern. If it has a pattern, then it can be modeled. And it